from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming. Five emotionally troubled teens sit in the special topics in English class at the Wooden Door School in Vermont, and they listen to their teacher, Mrs. Help me pronounce her Quinnell. name. Quinnell. Quinnell. She's talking about the book she has assigned them to read. It's Sylvia Plath's The Bell Jar. And Meg Wolitzer writes this. Everyone is paying very close attention to her. We're talking about the novel, right? But maybe we're not. We're talking about ourselves. And I guess that's what can start to happen when you talk about a book. So a book can be a passport to other worlds. I certainly found it to be that in my own life. And it's what Meg Wolitzer's novel, Belzar, is about. She's the author of a number of books for young and not so young adults, uh, short fiction as well. I'm Susan Stamberg. I work for National Public Radio. Uh, and welcome to all of you. Do you mind giving us a quick plot summary? Absolutely. Okay. Um, I pronounce it Beljar, but I will answer to Belzar. I will answer to Anna Karenina. I mean, honestly, I, especially <laughs> to Anna Karenina. Book. That's your next book. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, but uh, it's about a girl who has tragically lost her boyfriend and is sent to uh, a boarding school for emotionally fragile, highly intelligent teenagers. I would have killed to go to that school, but no, Syosset High School, I had to go there. <laughs> Um, and when they're there, um, she and some other kids are put into a class where each semester they only read one writer. And this year they're reading Sylvia Plath. And they write in journals. And when they write in the journal, something fantastical happens. Each student is reunited with the thing or person they've lost. And Jam, my main character, is reunited with her boyfriend. So that is the essential premise. Mm -hmm. And there are five of them all together, uh, all of whom have gone through some awful trauma or other, and they're coming together to at least try to, to confront that trauma within, in a community which is attempting to get them to confront it, and, and it's not always easy. So tell us what, now how are you saying it, Beljar? Beljar? I say Beljar, it's a, it's a play on Beljar. the title, The Beljar. Has, yeah. Have most of you, some of you read The Beljar? Yes. Those of you who haven't, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. <laughs> no, you don't have to have read The Bell Jar to uh, <laughs> read this book at all. Yeah, but, but how, did they, how do they get there? Which is really the, the, whole, the spine of this well, book. Well, you know, how for they me, get the fact, yeah, I mean, I mostly write adult fiction, which sounds like porn, I know, adult <laughs> fiction. Um, but I've always been really interested in adolescence. And when I decided to write this book, that was the same. And I was thinking about adolescence and about the fantasy element of this book, which for me is really quite metaphorical. They get there because they write in a journal, and when they write in the journal, they go back to the moment before everything went bad. And I think the power of writing in a journal for a teenager or thinking about things like that, thinking about writing expression, the moment when you can't bear something, these are all very fresh adolescent feelings to me, so I wanted to sort of run with that. But I bet they're the same feelings that you have, don't you? Once you sit down, I'm thinking of John Didion who said, I never know what I, what I think until I sit down and begin to write it. Don't you, isn't that your oh, process Oh, absolutely, as well? it's still the greatest thing. I mean, when I think about myself writing the poetry that I did, I mean, I, or, you know the poetry voice? Have you been to poetry readings where, I come into the room, <laughs> the oranges are on the table. That was me, that was me at 15, writing. I remember seeing in a book the, the phrase, like so much water. And then I made sure to put that in everything I wrote, you know? And I don't even know what it means, but I, I had a sense, what I'm, I will answer your question. Um, don't be in any rush. Okay, I good. had the sense that language was so powerful. I have not lost that sense, of course. My mother is a writer, and I grew up in a house where language was valued, and we understood when a sentence was good, like we understood 
why something made lyrical sense or why it moved you. And that remains true to this day. And I think that the power of expression, I mean, I will fight for it. I, when I see it somewhere, I want everybody to know about it. I want to wear a sandwich board for fiction and, and I think, and nonfiction too, because in this book, it's really about getting it down mm -hmm. and how powerful that is. Mm -hmm. And what happens to them, it becomes transformative. What's the assignment that Mrs. Cornell gives to those They students? have to write in their journal but they only can write, um, what is it, twice a week? They can only write twice a week. And in fact, as it turns out, they go to this place that they then call Beljar as a code name um, because they don't want anybody else at the school finding out what they're doing. They call it Beljar to one another. They can only go there twice a week because it's too intense an experience. And it's unclear if the teacher knows what's happening to them. We find out everything at the end. But she wants them to just write in a journal. She says she will collect them at the end, but she won't read them but they have to get everything down. And they can go back to uh, what is around the terrible trauma that got them there. So they're going back into their own lives and it becomes so difficult for them at times and so wonderful, especially for the heroine Jam, which is short for Jamaica. Well, you know, the, the play on the title, The Bell Jar, if those of you who've read The Bell Jar, you know, when I read that book, I was 15, which was 14 or 15, around Jam's age, when she actually loses her boyfriend. And I was on a train, the Long Island Railroad. My friend Amy, who was my most bookish friend, she also told me to read Colette. I didn't like that. I thought that was really boring. She's so complainy. It's like, I'm <laughs> such an idiot. Um, Probably you need to be a little older. Oh, well, that. that's the thing. Col yeah, this is a big parenthesis. But Colette was, you know, what is that about getting older? It's not going to happen to me. <laughs> Flash forward to this crone sitting here. I know, <laughs> weeping. I'm a, you know, I'm an old courtesan now, and <laughs> I've lost my young lover. Um, That's the next book. <laughs> it is, yeah. But my, my friend Amy said you have to read the Bell Jar, and this one was a good match for me, um, better than Colette for me. And um, I remember feeling, oh my God, Sylvia Plath feels things so deeply. She's writing about her own experience. Um, and she writes about the excitement of New York and that life that when she won the Mademoiselle Magazine Guest Editor Contest, I actually won that same contest. Oh my goodness. So that was another connection that I felt when I thought to write this book. Um, we were the last ones to win that contest. They canceled it after us. We were so bad. <laughs> I really think it was because of us. They invited us to a jeans wear luncheon <laughs> and my friend, my good friend Jesse, who I met there, um, Jesse Green, who became the theater critic for New York Magazine, he and I kept going up to people from the magazine saying, when will Mr. Zwer be at the luncheon? Mr. Gene Zwer. Like, we were so obnoxious, they canceled it right away. But Plath wrote about that summer, and then when everything fell apart. Yeah. And I wanted to capture that. I read in, in the bell jar, the explosion of emotions was so strong, even though they weren't my feelings, it wasn't my experience, I didn't have a breakdown as an adolescent. I think the reason that book is so powerful to young people is because it shows you that sometimes feelings are out of control, mm -hmm. that things can be unvarnished, that you will have your own life that's separate from your parents, that you might feel isolated, all kinds of things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you deal with so many serious and heavy themes in this book you're dealing with. Uh, these young people are experiencing death, they're experiencing the loss of love, the end of friendships, uh, uh, the loss of the full use of their bodies. You know, when I was growing up, I read The Five Little Peppers and how they grew. I mean, yeah. or Cherry Ames' Student Nurse, which was a great favorite of mine yeah. as a young woman. But it's a different world, isn't it? Do you remember why Cherry Ames was named Cherry? Cause I her don't. Cheeks looked slapped. It had that. She had cherry. I love no, those she books. Did there, this like Scarlett O'Hara. Right. Probably, there was I also think. Cherry Ames' cruise nurse, which sounds a little yeah. dirty, <laughs> doesn't it? I know. <laughs> no, I love that. Absolutely virtuous, Cherry. Come on. I love that series. Well, I think that YA books. You know, it's been a revelation to me. I started writing this book actually because I had a teenager at home. And he was a young teenager at the time, and he had read John Green's book, Looking for Alaska, which probably most of you have read. And, and he loved it, and I read it, and I was 
really amazed. First of all, I loved it so much. And, but what I didn't understand was that my son was clearly thinking about mature themes and things that I didn't know he was thinking about because that book spoke to him so deeply. Mm -hmm. And I realized that when you write a YA book, you, you don't have, if you're an adult writer, you don't have to hold yourself back in mm -hmm. the important ways. I mean, I think that good writing is good writing. And if you write the book you want to find on the shelf or that your 15-year-old self might have found, wanted to find on the shelf, you'll be okay. 15 is about the worst year of your life. I mean, it certainly was for me. Yeah. And so to reach all that turmoil and raging hormones, the whole thing, none of you are old enough to remember that, but I, uh, I do, and how rough oh, that yeah. was and what books meant to me at that age. Oh, they mean everything to you. Because you could get out of yourself as you can with any great book and, and go to some other world. Oh, absolutely. Well, that's what I tried to do with going to Beljar. It's kind of a metaphor. I mean, it's less <laughs> fantasy. For me, the idea of fantasy, like I had a fantasy. I wrote a middle grade book about kids who play Scrabble, and this boy has a fantastical ability to feel uh, things on flat surfaces so he can reach into a Scrabble bag and pull out all the good letters. Um, but the level of fantasy, the way I mean it, both in this book and there, is kind of like, if you remember, we used to eat um, seal test Sunday cups, and they were a, about as much of a Sunday as any, I mean, they had like the lightest thread of chocolate. For me, fantasy threads very lightly through these books, and it has a metaphorical resonance more than anything else, because the idea of changing how things really are, mm -hmm. especially when they feel really bad, is a very, very evocative and exciting one to me. Mm -hmm. Did you go to books as a, as a child for those reasons? What, what, what would lead you to pick up a book? Your mother never had it, it made you do that, I know, and nobody ever had to urge you to do it. I'm no, sure. although I read actually something about how if you want to get kids to read, you sort of turn the book into a kind of forbidden object. Mm -hmm. So I tried to do this like when my kids were little you know, bedtime, close that book, and then I'd listen outside the door, you know, <laughs> out there turning the pages. Because there is something, Susan, about the intimacy of a novel that I think makes it so powerful. It's just you and that world, and there's sort of nothing between the two of you, and it's very, very private, and it's very real and vivid. I went to books for many reasons, for solace, for excitement. Um, we, one thing that I really appreciate about my parents and the household that we lived in was that we didn't, there wasn't like a distinction always being made, like this is a good book, this is a bad, I mean we read a lot of things that we would not consider today to be great, but I, but it was all, like also like we watched a lot of television too, but we, we absorbed stuff, so I mean we absorbed all kinds of things and we were always taking in and I think that that's what writers do, so if I think about what in my childhood made me a writer, um, it's the books I read, but it's not necessarily the quality of them, but it's the fact that I knew that they mattered to me. Because as I took them in, I took in their nutrients, I took in things that I started to recognize as more valuable than others, things that were not particularly good but stayed with me. Mm. Um, you know how it is. Like, you never know what's going to matter to you. What were favorites of yours? Well, Charlotte's Web was the first book I cried at. Mm -hmm. I remember sitting with my mother reading that book and weeping. And you think about it, it's like, you know, Wilbur's a pig, but he's not a pig. And I think I understood that as a mm -hmm. child, that this is a pig, but this is every person. And E.B. White was trying to make points about friendship and, you know, that wonderful line about, you know, uh, well, a couple of wonderful lines. You're born, you live a little, you die. I mean, that's like... I, my motto, like, because I kind of feel when you write, if not now, when? Yeah. This is it, like, this is it now. I was once, I hope you don't mind my digress, Good it. digressing it, a little bit. I was on a panel at another book festival. Oh, I feel so guilty that I went to another book festival. Um, it wasn't as good as this No, one. really, it sucked. No, um, I was on a panel and uh, a writer came up to the other writers on the panel afterwards and said, you're all so like open in your books. You write about whatever you want, and I'm afraid to do that because I have to face the mothers at my kid's school in the morning. And it, I think it was her first book. And I felt bad for her because she was going to sort of hold herself back for um, hmm. people she might not even necessarily like. I mean, I don't know if she knew them very well, and mm -hmm. I kind of think you can't really do that. Charlotte's Web really mattered. I loved A Wrinkle in Time. 
and I had a particular affinity for that book because the character's name is Meg. And so I was like, you know. How'd you like Little Women? I loved Little Women, too. Yeah. And I was really glad not to die in that one. Um, <laughs> very glad that it was another March who did. Um, I, I'm trying to think of what else I read and really loved. I went through a period of teen problem books. Um, pregnancy was a big one and drugs. Mm. Like, go ask Alice, which was apparently fake. What right? is it? Was it? A, oh. I it, need to read it. Huh? Do some of you know? Go, remember, go ask Alice. It was the it was the journal supposedly of a girl who got messed up with drugs, and it was really lurid. And then I think it was supposed to be the real anonymous journal, but then it turned out that maybe it had been embellished or faked or something like that. But I didn't really care because mm -hmm. that's the thing about books. I mean, novels. Well, they're all faked, right? The, these things didn't happen, and yet. I think what a novel is, it's like, okay, it didn't happen, but it might have. And I think the might have. If books don't feel like they might have, then, then they're not really working. I read a book called um, My Darling, My Hamburger uh, by Paul Zendel about teen pregnancy. I was so really into teen pregnancy, I think, looking back on these things, just in terms of I guess I wanted to be sort of in the neighborhood of trouble without having to experience that trouble myself. Mm -hmm. And that's what, again, books do for you. They are adventures. They're like alpine experiences of some kind. Uh, and at that point, I started to start reading when I got you know, into adolescence. Like When I read Virginia Woolf, there's a big leap there. But it's more directly about language, which I think I'd been circling. Mm -hmm. And then I felt, but when I started doing that, I got very pretentious, and I would carry books with the covers facing out, you know, so people could see <laughs> what I'm reading. I'm like, keep my thumbs strategically over Virginia Wool, you know, so they know what I'm reading. <laughs> um, but those were all really important to me. Yeah, yeah. But back to these themes, which uh, it's really a, an age issue uh, between us, is gen generational. Uh, the books of my youth really were books of escape in one way or oh. another. And they were always about happy childhoods. They, you know, the worst th thing that could happen was uh, a dog ran away. So that you, you know, the kinds of things that young people obviously are having to deal with these days and the themes that you are, uh, are, are dealing with in this, that what I was, was saying before about death and, the, and loss and all of that, it's completely different. So I think uh, it's not so much about escape now. It's about something else. There's a kind of loss of innocence here. Well, I don't know that it's, I think it's possible for it to be both things, actually, yeah. that when you say that. When you said that about happy childhoods, I was thinking about um, All of a Kind Family. If some of you read that, these books about this Jewish family on the Lower East Side, uh, and I loved these books more than anything. It was about sisters and closeness. I think what these books all have in common, listening to you say that now, is that the characters are characters you remember. Somebody said about books that we don't remember plot of the books we love, it's character. And mm -hmm. I think that's really true. You do escape even in books that have problem stories. I think even in books with kind of you know, with serious problems, with, with mental illness issues like uh, the bell jar, um, you are escaping the present reality of your, the, the, the minutia of your own life. It's not for release necessarily, but you escape means that there are, there are a lot of ways into a door. I think of, uh, into a book, I think of books as all being sort of like an advent calendar, you know, with a lot of different doors mm. and a lot of possible mm -hmm. ways in. You don't have to escape into a kind of light world, but you can escape into something intense. And I think that some, maybe today's world, because teenagers who are growing up in this very accelerated pace mm -hmm. of a world, mm -hmm. maybe they want to go somewhere that's fast moving. But it may not be all that different from what mm -hmm. you're describing. Except a book slows you down. The act of reading slows you down to a wonderful pace. I mean, I've never been a speed reader. But just that act of doing it is such a is such a oh, relief. Yeah. No, I feel that way too. I love the the butter churn, low tech nature of yeah. books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I hated. Like when my kids were little, there would be books that had like LED lights in them and buzzers. You know, I don't mm -hmm. know. Do you Pop think ups. I should ask for that in my next book? No, no, don't. 
The interesting's woo, woo, woo. It's like, you know, I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> We're going to want to hear uh, some questions from you. And there are microphones, if you can see them, uh, scattered around. So come on up. And we'll just do a little more talking first. Uh, what's your approach? How do you write? Do you uh, get up early in the morning first thing? Or do you get to it in an afternoon? Do you spend a whole day? How many hours? I write when I can. Um, mm. And I travel a lot for, for uh, doing things like this. So it's been, I just got back from the Philippines and I'm going off to Germany. So it's been, I know, uh, kind of crazy. But I've taught myself to write where I can. Like I'm writing right now. No, I'm not. Um, I'll write in an airport. I, the best times, if I had my way though, I write in the morning. I think writing when you feel that the world is asleep is a great time of day to write. When you feel that you're the only one up in the world, there's a great privacy and intimacy. Again, like the experience of being inside a book. Um, I'm very disciplined. When I'm excited and I'm writing a book, I will just write for hours and hours. I don't, I tend not to write at night anymore, except when I'm like nearing the end of a book and I have to take these people to their fates. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you ever have the feeling that you just don't want to let them go, that you, you'll, every oh, time, yeah. every time, do you? Every time. Yeah. When I wrote my last adult novel, The Interestings, um, I felt <laughs> very involved with the characters. Um, but pe readers will ask you, like, what are those people doing now? Or like, I'm like we don't understand that question. Yeah. I feel like a novel for most writers is sort of like if you saw the movie um, The Truman Show, do you remember at the end of the movie when he uh, finds the edge of the world and kind of re reaches the glass? I think the characters in a novel are all sort of inside almost a kind of terrarium and I leave them there, but I miss them terribly. I yeah. absolutely miss them. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we have questions. Hi, um, I'm a big fan of your work. I think you're great at portraying adolescence in the interestings. Um, I'm also a teacher, and you're great at that too, in the uncoupling, really wonderful. I look forward to reading this book. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit, is it different writing a Y, how is it different writing a YA novel compared to something for adults? Thank you, by the way. Um, you know, I try to, well, the, dif the difference is maybe more the difference in these two books, The Interestings and Beljar, than it is just more generically for me. Because in Beljar, I wanted to have a breathless first person voice. She had to tell her story, she had to get it out. So it had to be kind of a fast, barreling through it kind of story. But that was really as much about her as anything else. The Interestings, which I don't know if anybody here read, but it, um, it follows teenage characters for over 40 years, almost 40 years, I guess. And that's, they're taking the long view. I'm taking the long view. In Beljar, I'm taking the short view. My character can't take the long view yet. She doesn't know that things will change. Mm -hmm. So it was a kind of a voice difference, really, more than anything else. I think there's ways that when I write for adults, I guess I'm, I tend to allow myself to be more digressive. But I think that may just be about the story, as I've thought of it. Um, they have to be good. They have to feel real. You know, you can't game the system either way. Mm. Mm. Yes. Hi, Meg. Hi. It's been a long time since I've seen you. I think it's been a few decades. Terry? Yes. Ah. <gasps> My neighbor from down the block. <laughs> uh, this is crazy. This is like a TV show now. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, you look the same. <laughs> uh, thank you. I, I assure you, I'm not. Um, I've, I've followed your work. I remember when you got reviewed for The Interestings, and I saw the review in The Times, and then I saw the, the notice in Entertainment Weekly, and I thought, wow, this is really cool. Look how good Meg's doing. And then I read the book, and I, I would read through it and think, gosh, Meg, that's a really good sentence you wrote. And it, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, and, and my husband can attest to that because I told him that. And, uh, and he's Where here. was all and this, by the way? Where did you grow up? Where we, we grew up we, on the we, same street. On the same street and drive. In, and drive in Syosset, New York, when we both you know, went to the same elementary school, junior high school, oh, high God. school. See, this is one of the fun parts about being a writer. <laughs> yeah. And um, so I wanted to come here and say, you know, Good job. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, and I'm. Thank you. I was. I was glad. I was. I was able to come and see you because I know. I mean, I live here, and I know you live in New York. So uh, you know, it's it's paths and cross a lot. So I'm glad you were 
you were down here and I was able to, uh, you know, Thank say you. hi. Well, I will say one anecdote from our shared childhood. Your mother lined a, gr a bunch of us up to do a spelling bee, and I had the word vacuum. And I was positive I had it right. V-A-C-U-M. And she said, no. And I said, no. And I was so shocked that I couldn't get it right. And I remember feeling almost insulted <laughs> that my mastery of language did not extend to vacuum. So I, I think it was because of that paralyzing experience that made me the writer that I am today. <laughs> well, I will say one, one other thing about um, Meg was writing in school like a lot and not just because we had to write for assignments you know we you wrote for literary magazines and yes. and you know you were like the one person i could predict yeah meg's gonna be a writer uh, and sure enough well, here you are here she is. well it's very nice to see you i had on the way to school actually i told myself a sort of serial novel every day it was about these it's so weird when i think of it now it's about these two brothers who were heirs to the Kraft cheese fortune. <laughs> <laughs> and I, t and one was bad and one was good. I don't, it's because, you know, I ate Kraft singles, American, I, that's how, but that's how things start. You know, they start in a strange way. People ask you, where do you get your ideas? And writers sometimes are obnoxious and say, Cleveland. But the thing is, <laughs> where do they come from? I mean, I think for me with Beljar, like, and with the interestings, with both of them, something marinates in you for a very long time. And you don't, the best ones are when you don't know that's happening. Mm. Because, I mean, I read The Bell Jar, and I actually went to Smith before transferring to Brown, and Sylvia Plath had gone to Smith, and I was very steeped in Plathiana when I was there. And there was a girl at Smith who wore black all the time and who, like, chose to live in Sylvia Plath's room, I think, and, and I read her journals. So, but I didn't know that one, you know, that one day I would write this book. Mm. I mean, so... But it was there. But it was there, and I think that for those of you... Are some of you writing, trying to write, or writing? Yeah, I think that... One of the great things is that things are there, and you'll find them later. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Maybe the two of you could have a little chat later, and the people behind you who uh, oh, wanted to ask some questions. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, Hi. I was curious, writing verse to young adults versus writing to adults, I'm wondering, do you approach these um, heavier and equally important but kind of you know, intense topics from a different perspective, do you feel, is, is there some sort of responsibility that an author has to talk about, you know, loss and things like that to a younger reader who hasn't experienced that before versus to an adult? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that the main thing is that, that I love that Emily Dickinson line, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Hmm. I think fiction has to tell the truth. I think that sometimes it's not that you soften it or sugarcoat it for a teenager, but you try to put it in a way that they who have not had the experience that you as an older person might have had, you try to make it understandable. I think that's the thing is make everything human, make everything understandable in some way mm -hmm. um, and, and true to human experience. And then it becomes bearable, I think. Mm -hmm. See the characters struggle and see them work through things. So we have time for another question. Hi. Hi. Um, what process do you go through in creating your characters? Um, I, when I create my characters, well, here's the thing. When I picture them in my mind, people are always asking writers um, if, they, if they plan the casts for their TV shows based on their books or their movies. And in fact, I have had a couple of things made into movies, and the interestings may be a TV series. And uh, Nora Ephron's first film that she directed was based on my book, uh, it was the movie This Is My Life with Julie Kavner. And, you know, the characters now, when I see them, of course, they become those actors. But I think when you try to keep it free of that, it's sort of like on a reality TV show, how the people don't want to be filmed, their faces are blurry in the background. That's who my characters are. Mm -hmm. They're a little bit, their faces are a little bit blurry when I'm writing them. But to me, their essence is very, very vivid. I think about how they talk and how they talk to each other. That's one thing. I start writing down details, like things that I don't even use in the book. Mm. 
who would they have voted for president uh, in this election, even if the book takes place in the 1860s? Um, what was their first dream that they remember? Things like that. And I start to, I, they just start to interact with one another, and then I can almost but not quite see them. So it's sort of like people in a dream. You know the way people in a dream, like you have access to them, but not exactly. It feels that way working with characters. I write a lot of things down when I have a line. I don't even know what it means or what it's going to be. A name, a line, little words. I always did that when I was growing up. Little scraps of things. So if you're writing, um, are you writing? Writing, yeah. I just write down little weird things that don't necessarily mean anything yet, but will eventually. Um, so that's kind of how I develop characters. Did you have another question you wanted to ask? No? OK. This was lovely to talk with you, Meg. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Very generous. Oh, thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.